something that I need to do that I forget. So I just want to welcome everybody to, I think, week number four. Uh, we're going to be talking about chapter four workflow code style. But um, Dewey wanted to take a second to introduce, I think, a really good opportunity for people in the community to participate in another kind of book club thing. So Dewey, I'm just going to turn it over for, to you to kind of do your pitch and then I'll jump back in whenever you're done. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, I think uh, folks that sort of heard my introduction on this on this uh, book club know that I, I'm a first year master's student at the University of Notre Dame. And every Tuesday, they have a Tidy Tuesday book, a Tidy Tuesday group meeting over Zoom. Uh, they've been doing it for five or six years. It was founded by one of the very first Notre Dame students uh, many years ago. And it's a, it's a really great opportunity to come together with a small group and we present uh, a visualization or your thoughts on the data or anything like this. There, it's absolutely no pressure. You can come and just listen and learn, you know, by osmosis <laughs> if you want, or uh, you're really encouraged as well to present. And I mean, I, I knew R for one week and I could... I could do a basic GG plot with no frills at all. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, go ahead, just show it. Cause they, you know, they, they tell you kind of how you can, how you can mas massage the data a little bit differently. And it's really opening, really welcoming to people of all levels. So if, um, and I'll put the link here in the, in the chat, if, uh, if you all want to want to join us, we got plenty of room and we'd love to have you there. I know, uh, Ola came uh, from from the book club here. I think he came uh, last week. Uh, so I hope hope to hope to see you all there if you'd like uh, and have some time. Yeah, let me contribute. I was actually there on Tuesday, and it was quite it was quite revealing and insightful. So I okay. urge everybody to anybody who can happy to also join. Yeah. So the link's there and uh, you can, we, there should be from there, you can see the, the each week that we meet and we cover the week before this data. So like this week, like on Tuesday coming up, we're, we'll be going over the Shakespeare data. So that's the only thing when you first start, you might be off a week. <laughs> so next week is the Shakespeare data, not the, not the one following. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing, Dewey. That's I think that's an excellent opportunity. I I did not know that that was available to um, the wider community, and I think it's a great opportunity for people to join in if you absolutely can. Um, and then too, if if people aren't familiar with Tidy Tuesday, it's it's managed by this community as well. Um, I know John Harmon and others. So John the Geek, you probably see him in the Slack. He's kind of the executive director, I think, is his title of this entire group. Um, he kind of manages that with some other people. Tidy Tuesday, not the Notre Dame um, Tidy Tuesday walkthrough. So if you're not familiar with that, just honestly, if you type Tidy Tuesday into Google, I'm sure you'll get some hits for it. It's a, It's been a really popular thing for several years, and it's a great kind of learning tool if people are not familiar with it to kind of learn R, also learning how to do data visualization. So, so thanks for sharing, Dewey. I really appreciate that. You bet. Okay, cool. Um, cool. I think we'll probably get started for today. Like I mentioned before, we're going to talk about workflow code style, or chapter four, workflow code style. And I'm going to take it, I'm going to leave the discussion. It's a shorter chapter. Um, but I also, as I was reading through it, I know we have like a wide range of people who are newish to more seasoned R users. And so I kind of wanted to sprinkle in some like extra stuff that I think maybe some of the seasoned um, R programmers or R users would find interesting as well. Um, I was talking to Dewey before we got started today. Uh, currently, I'm on a work project right now, uh, working with one of my coworkers, and we're we're doing a lot of refactoring right now. And so a lot of the stuff is kind of top of mind, like thinking about style and thinking about how we can write good code to be maintainable and um, talk about some of those general conventions. So let me share my screen here. Let's see, share screen. I want to go desktop one. Yes. Okay. Can people see my slides? Anybody, anybody having issues? Can people see my slides? Thumbs up. Okay. I got some thumbs up. Great. 
I'm going to try my best to monitor the chat as usual. If I do miss anything, just let me know or feel free to jump in on mute yourself. I'm, this is like, like always, I'm pretty flexible for anybody to jump in, add any comments wherever this isn't a formalized presentation. So please jump in if I get anything wrong or you have any comments that you want to add. So again, we're going to talk about code style. Uh, it basically, this is a good rundown from the tidyverse style guide, which I'll point out here in a second, but I think this kind of emphasizes why we need to consider style, right? Good coding style is like correct punctuation. You can manage without it, but it sure makes things a lot easier to read. And so I think just reading this right here can kind of emphasize the importance of style, right? Just because something's working doesn't necessarily mean it's well-written. And so we're going to take some time talking about this. This kind of comment comes from the Tidyverse style guide, which is a style guide that has been put together by the Tidyverse team. So we use the Tidyverse, we use packages in the Tidyverse. It is an open source set of packages. They have an entire team that is supported by Posit um, and Posit has those teams put those together and you can access those and you can look through this. I highly suggest reading through it or even just kind of poking through some of these but it goes into detail about how they strive to write code. And I think some of this is some good information for people to follow. Um, I'm not gonna cover every bit and piece of it. Like I said, it's an entire book in and itself, but I do pull some of my style from this as well. And I think it helps make code more readable, more maintainable and easier to work with. So highly suggest checking that out. So by the end of today, what you should get a sense of is you should be able to have a familiarity of how to use the style R package to apply style rules. Also have a background of selecting good variable names. What I'm gonna sprinkle in today is going beyond just naming variables, but considering naming other components of your code. Also like how to appropriately utilize spaces between mathematical operators and apply the pipe operator to make our code more readable. Now, one thing that I do want to mention is, is there, some of this can be very opinionated, right? Like we all kind of have a sense of what good code looks like for us. And so, you know, feel free to add in uh, if you have any good conventions that you follow or that your team follows. At the end of this entire thing, because I know there's a lot of opinions for how to write good looking code or the craft of writing good looking code, um, is just pick something that works for you. Pick something that works for you, pick something that works for your team and pick something that works for the people that you work with because it's just gonna make your life easier in the end if you kind of take the time to sit there and say, this is the style that we're going to follow or at least strive to follow in our code. So um, to first kind of start off, the book talks about this package called Style R. I will be honest, I don't use style R as much as some other people that I've seen before. But basically what style R is, it gives you some functionality or added functionality within R Studio to um, change your code to, file, to follow a specific style that you set up or has already been set up. So you can customize this as far as you want. Um, I don't use this as much because I, I like to follow kind of my conventions rather than having to write my code and then run it. But some people find a convenience out of using it. Um, but I do want to say that it is available to you. You just have to install the package. And there's some command palettes and commands that you can run in our studio to actually use it. I know I'm not doing good justice to the power of this package. So if anybody wants to add in any comments or if they've used this, um, I'm gonna open it up to the group for anybody to add any additional um, comments or use cases that they found style R to be beneficial. Does anybody use it? Okay, cool. I have a thought um, I, yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I did see, I did see that there, there was one really cool thing when I went to pause comp this year, I saw somebody had their own like custom style set up for style R. So that was kind of cool, but I just haven't sunk enough time in it to, to figure out like how to actually write and set that up. But 
you could be hyper customized if you want to use style R, if you have a very specific style that you want to follow. Um, but yeah. Cool. Um, so check it out. If it's something that you like working with, use it. I just have it integrated into my workflows. Um, I'm sure it has a lot of benefits. I just haven't dug into it yet. So let's talk about names. So there are some general rules that you need to follow when you name things in R. Names should use only lowercase letters, numbers, and underscores. Um, again, these are general rules. There are cases where these get broken. I know we talked about this a little while ago about like lowercase letters. There are certain conventions in R, especially when you start doing like OOP with um, like S3, R6. There's some conventions where uppercase letters get used. Um, but that's just a style thing. It's not a syntax thing. It's not about writing valid code. It's just the way people write code. Um, also too, you'll notice that some of the, like some of the base R code that's out there, they may kind of not use the conventions that the tidyverse style uses, right? They're not, there may be uppercase letters. There may be the name, dot, name, so on and so forth. So in general, these are the things that you want to kind of follow, lowercase letters, numbers, and underscores. Um, but it really comes back to select something that works best for you and works best for your team and that everybody follows. So pick something and just follow it. I think in our case, we use snake case uh, where I work. Um, it was just something that I chose and I was just like, I'm going to go with this. We're just going to go with snake case. And so when it comes to the tidyverse style guide, it suggests using snake case. So an example of this would be from last week using that New York City flight data. So we're just doing a simple filter. Uh, it's basically saying for like, if we're naming a variable, we're going to use it, use an underscore rather than all capitals. Um, I do, I do, I do say this, but there is a place where I do use all capitals and somebody can jump in like if I have like an environment variable that I have on my system and if for our new new people that are here, if you don't know environment variables, that's fine. But there are some environment variables that I set on my computer that are global to the entire like system. I use all capitals for that. So this could be context specific, but usually when you're writing your R code, just stick to snake case or pick a case that you're gonna use everywhere else. Um, I don't know. I want to open it up to anybody else or any comments that people have about snake case or other cases. I know, I think when Dewey was talking last time in workflow basics, they shared that graphic of all the different cases or the different like styles that are available. But I don't know. Does anybody have any comments, suggestions on using snake case? I really like uh, snake case. Uh, it's just, if you were, tend to have long variable names, which I do, this, uh, the extra underscores you know, add to the length of your variable name. So that's the only drawback that I can see, but I find it very legible and easy to parse for me when I read through a code. So I prefer using it. Yeah, Trevin, I saw you jump off. Thank you very much. Uh, Trevin, I saw you jump off. Did you want to add something or jump on, turn your camera oh, on? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we mentioned maybe the janitor package previously um, in past meetings, but that's also an easy way to at least convert like column names to snake case, or maybe there's a different um, style that you want, but that's a good shortcut. What package is that? Um, it's janitor. Janitor, it's okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with, I, I just, okay. hear, I didn't hear what you said there. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, and then, yeah, so uh, Colin, you mentioned the environmental environment variables. There could be like some instances where say you have a specific style for a function versus like a variable or something that could be like <clears throat> another preferred style choice just to like make it easier on you to see the differences. Yeah, exactly. It's it's context specific. Like, you know, if you're 
and again, I'm like trying to keep in our beginners too. If you don't know what global global variables are, that's fine. Um, but like, just know like where you're working could depend on what type of style you use. And so I was just kind of thinking about that, like, yeah, where would I use all caps? Oh yeah, environment variables, at least in our case is where we use like all caps, but that's outside of like our code, but I like, I like that brought up. Um, Stefan also brought up like the only drawback that I've seen is like when your variable names get very, very long. Um, that's like my one like consternation of underscores is like if you have a very long variable name, the underscores are like, ugh, gets to me, but that's just the nature of the code that you're writing. So, but that gets at like this next point here about, you know, names should be descriptive, right? And I know there's different arguments for this. I lean towards because we are writing analysis code with R, we're not necessarily writing like system code and I'm not a computer programmer by any means. So I don't know all the conventions and other programming languages. I lean towards um, having long descriptive names over like short concise names. I just do that for readability. I understand that like, and again, I, I'm not a computer programmer, but in the past you would strive for performance. And so you would strive for really short variable names so the computer doesn't have to process it. But now, nowadays it's like computers are so fast and compute is so cheap that it's like, as long as you're staying within reason, long descriptive names are better in my view. Again, there's a lot of opinions with that, but I think it just helps with readability, especially in the context of analysis code to make long descriptive names. Um, yes, concise names are fast to type, but just also know that RStudio and any ID you use also has autocomplete features that help with longer names. So if you do have a long variable, you can use a tab out or you can use the actual like drop down that shows up to help you select functions that have long variable names. And I'll show you that functionality here in a second. So um, I do have to say, I, I'm also working on an open source project right now that I'm going through some older code and there's some code in there that like somebody is using like single letters for function names. And that is like really hard for me to figure out and go through that. And I'm like, that probably made sense to you what that single letter meant when you wrote the code. But now as I'm going through this legacy code, I'm sitting there like, I have no idea what you mean by this function name O or DD or T. So it just helps having descriptive names, especially if somebody has to, somebody other than you or your future self has to go look at your old code and be like, what is this variable? What is this function? I have no idea. So the other thing um, is leverage consistent patterns. Uh, a great example of this is using prefixes. This is more for like function design. Well, it goes for variable design too. But a great example of this from a tidyverse package is string R. If anybody asks me about like, what is a good example of like naming conventions? I always lean on string R because in the string R package, if you're not familiar, it helps you work with uh, character strings and it helps you do some of the parsing and all that. But what's nice about this is that every function starts with str. So if you don't necessarily remember what that string R function is, you can jump over to our studio in the console, in your code, type str underscore and get a listing of all the string R functions. And that helps tremendously. So I'm gonna jump over to R studio so you can see this. So I bring in string R, hopefully people can see this. If I need to bump it up, let me know. If I type in str, it's gonna bring up some type of modal here that I can quickly go through and see, uh, I can't remember if it's string extract or string extract all or whatever. You can find it really quickly and it helps you narrow down what you're looking for really, really quickly by having good names for your objects or functions or variables or whatever it is. So yeah, I think string R is a great example of that kind of convention of having consistent, con consistent names for your objects, whatever code you're writing. Um, and then take advantage of tab completion, what it showed. Uh, this is uh, another thing that's beyond what was in the book, but like naming things are hard. It's like really hard. I think what's the old adage in computer programming, like there's only two really hard things in computer programming. It's like cache validation and naming things. I, I think those are the two things. And if you ask me what cache validation is, I, I don't know what it is, but um, yeah, there's that old adage out there that basically says that like 
there's only really two things hard in computer programming. It's that cache validation and naming things. But there's this book called The Programmer's Brain. I got introduced to it at Posit. I had been reading a little bit of it. I haven't read it all. This isn't an endorsement by any means, so I'm not asking you to go out and buy this, but just kind of showing you where this kind of concept came from. It's basically, it's this idea of how do you select names? You kind of go through this three-step process. Select the concepts to include in the name. So what is your code trying to do? Select those concepts. Choose like three or four, maybe even five words that best encapsulate what that thing's trying to do. And then construct a name from that. Now, I build on this a little bit more, um, especially with an analysis code, thinking about verbs and nouns. If you're creating an object, use that noun for the prefix. So if you're creating data, do like data, whatever that data is for your name. If you're trying to like get data, like if you're trying to like extract data from like a database or something and you're creating like a function or an object and you're doing something, use a verb for the prefix, like get or extract. And so that will help you kind of like name things a little bit better based on what you're trying to do. Am I trying to create an object in it or am I trying to do something with my code? Now that doesn't work in every case. And I don't know if my coworkers are on here today or not, but there was, um, we were in this situation where we're, we're doing some refactoring and we were like looking at this like function that we were creating and we're like, hmm, what should we do? What should we name this? It was a good lesson of like, just pick something and iterate on it because you can pull your hair out trying to figure out a name for something. And we were sitting back and forth maybe for like five to 10 minutes. And at the end of it, I was just like, it is what it is. Let's move on with our lives. So if you can follow these rules and you come to something good, good. If not, don't let the enemy of a perfect or don't let the, what is it? I can't think of the thing. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good, like get it done, but just keep these conventions in mind when you're naming things. So uh, I don't know if I want to open it up for anybody who wants to add to this naming. Like I said, it's one of the hardest things in, in programming or writing code, but does anybody want to add to my experience or any other words of wisdom that they would like to share? Yeah, I'm, I'll make a quick comment, Colin. Um, what I would say is, you know, one of the reasons why this is so important, uh, this is probably a, might be obvious to everyone on the call, but um, is, you know, I always strive to make my code auto documenting so that I don't have to litter comments to explain the code. You know, you still want comments in there to explain the why of what you're doing. But in general, someone who uses the same language as me should be able to read my code block and understand what what it's doing by the naming conventions I use, right? So it's it's, it's a very important part of making your code kind of auto-document. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I have some, I've sprinkled in some extra stuff in here that kind of talks about like some like design patterns of how to do that or to think about that. But I wish I put, put, a, put up the meme that I saw or somebody had this picture where it's like a picture of a cat they were making the thing of like how to do the self-documenting code. It was a picture of a cat, but then they had like a, a P, like a post-it note that said cat on top of the cat's head. Like, do you really need to add that? Like, no, like it, you could be able to look at it and know what it does. And so you strive for that, you know? And yeah, yeah, excellent. So, so thanks for adding that, Dewey. I really appreciate that. Anybody else have anything else that they want to add about it? So Trevin posted a, a thing from X on here. If people want to go check it out. Um, yeah, it, it comes back to like, this is stuff that you learn over time. It's not, you know, we, we sit here and we harp on it. It comes back to like the actual craft of writing it. But sometimes like, don't let the enemy of, of, of perfect or don't let perfect be the enemy of good. I probably should practice that before I use it. But um, yeah, sometimes good is better than perfect, but you should strive to do as best you can with it. So this is a little bit beyond the book, um, but I wanted to add it because I think it's really important when it goes to like the larger aspect of just like naming objects or things in like code itself. Um, I'm coining this as like good names transcend variables and objects. There is a really good um, 
like kind of like a five to 10 minute video that I have linked here. It's from Jenny Bryan. If, um, if you know anything or have been in the R kind of space for a while, Jenny Bryan is one of the, like, if you do like the Mount Rushmore of like tidyverse, like Jenny Bryan would be on it. If you don't know what Mount Rushmore is, um, I can explain more about it. Um, but she's right up there with Hadley. And I think probably like the, my top three, like our videos, she has like two of them of my top three. Um, but one that she has was for a conference called the norm comp. It's literally a five minute video and it talks about how to name files like a normie. And it is like the most simplest thing to look at, but it will make your life so much easier when you're thinking about how to name things, especially at the project level. So I thought this was really important when it talks about that idea of good names. I've had it linked here so you can go watch it later. It's literally five minutes. It's five minutes that I think will change your life is what I will say when it comes to writing this stuff. But she really makes this argument of like the holy trinity of file names, make them machine readable. So using things like lobbing slugs and the ability to use regex patterns to find it. Again, if you don't know those things, it's fine. I just wanted to sprinkle some of the other stuff for more of our seasoned um our people here um, also making human readable and sortable in a useful way and a good example of this would actually be our um our book club so if you look at like the file names they use a convention that helps us do those things right it's sortable in chronological order it's human readable and you could kind of use regex patterns if you don't know what regex are we're going to get to it um, to kind of search the file system in here. And so it's just a really good thing to kind of think about, like some of this naming conventions also goes into how you name your files within your project. Um, the other thing is, is think about your code chunks. Uh, make your code chunks, use these kind of naming conventions to make things easier to search and compute on. So something that I really strive for in my team and something about our style is we always add a label to our code chunks and our code chunks have these prefixes in them. And so I've just kind of given you a couple of examples here, like data import, wrangle, summarize, which is like data summary, like group by summarize, and viz, right? We're doing analysis code. You're gonna do the same things over again. Import data, wrangle data, summarize data, um, analyze data, visualize data. So there should be prefixes in here to kind of help you do this. Now, at first, Glance, this might not make sense, but what's nice about this is it makes your code easier to search. So I'm gonna jump over here. I have a throwaway, um, like our markdown. I just put in a bunch of code chunks with those. What's nice about this is now that I have these prefixes, what I can do is I can just search it. I can look up and say, oh, my manager wants to see viz, this visualization. Now, if I type in viz in the search, I can just quickly navigate through my file to find it, where those visits are. And that's because I took the time to think about the naming conventions to help me quickly search through my code to find those things. So just a little tip that I found kind of useful for our team. Uh, let's see, jump back over here. Um, and then like Dewey was saying, mentioned it earlier, like good naming can replace code comments. I have put this in here. I got introduced to this this summer. Um, this is not our code. So if you're seeing this and then you're like, this is not our code, the, the concepts still apply, but it kind of talks about how to use like explaining variables. So you don't have to use code comments. I think this is a great blog post to kind of read and understand because it really kind of discusses like, yeah, use your codes as comments, use your code as comments rather than actually writing comments. And so that comes back to that naming thing. You name things well enough. It's going to make your code um, easier to read and understand without having to put in comments. So this is a great, great article. I highly suggest anybody read it. Um, it's not R specific. I think this is JavaScript. Um, but yeah, people can take a look at it and check it out. I think it's really good. Cool. Uh, I think we probably spent enough time talking about names. So before I kind of transition over talking to talking about some of those general conventions, what questions do people have or comments that they would like to add um, about what I've discussed?
does anybody follow any of these conventions when they name other things, whether like file names or like labeling your code chunks? Does anybody follow like conventions and what are they if people do? One of the conventions I follow is I try to use verbs for functions in general, uh, or start it with a verb at least, then uh, that often is helpful. It doesn't always work, but it often works quite well. Yeah, that's excellent. Like if I have to, a good example from my perspective is like get, like if I have to get data from a database, get da da da, right? You know, cause you're getting it and you can look it up. Uh, Milo agrees with you. Um, Stefan, um, verbs for our function names. Excellent. Yeah, these are all awesome. Uh, kind of going back at that, going to that like selection of verb or noun, like if you're creating objects, like setting variables, like data. So instead of saying like survey, da, 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 you go like data survey something. So it makes it easier to search your code. So all you have to look for is that prefix in your code data. And you can like quickly go through your code data, 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 or viz plot you know like plot you can search for all the plot code it's just making it easier for you to search later on so um excellent okay cool uh let's talk about let's talk about some more of these general conventions i think i'm just going to go through these quickly but this is again going to readability consider your spaces and how you use spacing um math operators except for um exponentiation it's good to consider about putting spaces in between them. So you can see here, we have an addition and then a division. It's good to put a space in between these because it just makes it easier to read, uh, especially around your assignment operator that helps too. And then you also want to make sure that you avoid like doing things like this. I go back and forth between this because I've seen, well, when it comes to math operations, it makes sense. I've seen some places, especially within shiny code and some other stuff where people will put spaces like this. I go back and forth on if I should or not, but that's one of those things that you should just de decide and stick with it. So, but when it comes to like math operations and stuff in the assignment operator, just add spaces, simple as that. Uh, same thing with function calls. Um, again, I'm just gonna kind of go through these quickly because I think most of us probably understand this, but like consider your spaces here just be mindful of them. There's no space between your function calls and then between your arguments within a function, consider your spaces. If you have your first parameter here, comma, then space, and then you don't need one after. Pretty straightforward. It's just like regular English. Um, just be mindful of it. Uh, you can use extra spaces for alignment. Um, I like this in some cases, not all cases. This is one that I find to be very beneficial, especially if you're doing a mutate and you want to line up this. I think this is a great way to do it. You can add extra spaces here to do this alignment so you can quickly see, okay, what columns I'm creating. Um, the exercise, there is one, and especially within the solution in here, I was kind of like, they had this extra space to do alignment. I was like, eh, I don't know if it's needed. But again, it's one of those like case by case basis where like it helps make it more readable and other times it doesn't, but that's an opinion, not an actual fact. So, okay, uh, alignments. Oh, what's also nice about this is, and it doesn't talk about this in the book, or maybe it does a little bit, but if you do this in your code, where uh, actually this is actually coming down into indentation and actually nesting it. But if you write your code like this, it makes it a lot easier to move things around rather than it having like one long written thing. It helps you quickly move lines around rather than like, oh shoot, I have it here, copy, paste and move it around. It makes it easier to like shuffle these in your code. So that's just an added benefit. Uh, spacing with pipes, really important. So, Basically what you want to do is like anytime that you add in a pipe, you want to do a space before the pipe. Um, and then after this, you want to drop, drop it down into a new line and then obviously do two spaces here. I know there's discussion about tabs versus spaces in some areas of programming. Um, some places tabs are really important, um, but for readability in R, 
I think it's important to do, you know, at least two spaces here. Um, you want to avoid doing this one line thing, and you can kind of see why this might be the case, uh, because we obviously have to scroll for the example, but it's just readability. This is easier to read than this. Also too, it helps you rearrange. Like I was talking before, you can move this step down. You can do the count first and then do the filter. I don't know if you would necessarily want to do that in this case, but it's helpful to like move things around. It's easier to move this around than it is to move this around if you have to reorganize your code. And then um, it gives you that 50,000 foot view. Like if you're just quickly like scanning through your code and looking through it, this is a heck of a lot easier to figure out what you're doing than this is. Like you could quickly look at it here and be like, oh yeah, I'm just doing a filter count, right? It's just easier to read. So it gives you a better sense of like what you're doing. 50,000 foot view to see those verbs really, really quickly rather than having to parse through and figure out what's going on here. New lines, um, sticking with pipes here, um, put na named arguments on a new line. So, uh, and then put unnamed arguments on one line if they fit. So basically, if you have the opportunity to keep it on one line, you sure can. Um, but usually like if you're creating something new, it's just good to put it on its new line. I think I'm just reemphasizing what I talked about before, but it's just good to put everything on a new line. If you can, Put it in so like if you were only creating like if you were just doing like n equals n just doing like a count of rows grouped by um our tail number just do it on one line uh again there's places where you could break these rules but general convention is just to drop it down into a new line and then um indentation is really important as well so usually like if you're doing like this like group by summarize in the summarize, you want to drop it down and put two spaces. And this is really nice to show the nesting, right? Because you know that this code is associated with summarize. In addition to that, you want to make sure you line up your parentheses in the vertical order. Because if you can quickly see like this parenthesis matches up with this summarize function, it's going to help you match your parentheses a lot easier. Here in this simple code, it's not too bad. But for my Shiny developers or people who have used Shiny <laughs> in the past, um, Matching up your parentheses and your curly brackets is really important. And so you can really get into some really messy code and some really hairy situations if you don't follow this nesting structure and this nesting style. And it's really hard to debug if you get into that situation. I I found myself in situations with deleting out whole, whole codes of chunk to fix it and then restyle it and it makes it a lot easier. So. And then these are the things to avoid. I'm not gonna harp on these because I think most people kind of generally can see the difference between the two in regards to readability. Um, but the last thing before I open it up for comments and questions before moving on to the next concept is this idea of where you can break the rules. It's okay to break the rules if you could write this in one line, right? You can do that if it's more compactly, you certainly can. Um, but just do take into consideration that although this takes up more lines in your code, I guess you could make the argument that this might be a little bit easier to read, but you know, this is just as readable as this is. I think this is one of those situations, that gray area where you just have to decide what works best for you and what looks right. Um, for me, I would probably lean more towards this because it lets you expand this. So like, say you want to add more columns to it. This is easier to expand than this is um, if you have to come back to this code. And this isn't in the book, but this is a place where I kind of break the rules sometimes. Like if I'm creating a visualization and I just need to do like a really quick filter and I'm not being explicit in what my filtering is, I'll just do my one line pipe here to filter. Is this good or bad? Probably not. There would probably be somebody out there that would tell me, hey, you need to do the filter outside of this. I totally agree with you. But it's one of those things where it's like, I could do this really, really quickly here, just filter it here and move on with my code. So slap me on the wrist. I break the rules. I like to live life dangerously. This is one area where I break that rule. So, um, but I'm open to anybody convincing me why this is bad. Um, but yeah, I'm going to open up for any questions or comments um, if anybody would like to add anything to this, what we just talked about with pipes. All right, cool.
Cool. So let's talk about pipe length. Um, usually you want to limit your pipe length. So if you're doing like, you know, a bunch of pipes, you usually want to limit it to 10 to 15 lines. Again, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but this kind of gets into that area of what people call code smells. So if you're like looking at your code and you just kind of get that like cringy feeling of like something just doesn't seem right here, or you have to like scroll through like 30 lines of code, it might be a good point to say to yourself, okay, maybe I can do this better. And one of those conventions is like, if you're going with a pipe, like a bunch of statements, that's more than 15 lines, that should probably be a code smell for you that there's probably a better way. There may not be, but you should have at least have that thought of how can I break this up into smaller subtasks to make this more informative? Maybe take your long chain, set a variable, and then use that variable for something else. It's just, it's just one of those like general conventions to ask yourself, am I doing this as efficiently as I can? If not, maybe I need to fix it. Um, these spacing kind of conventions fall into ggplot2. Um, obviously, we have to switch from the pipe to a plus operator when we go to ggplot. Um, same kind of conventions. I'm not going to harp on it. Just consider your spacing. Um, I do have a question about this for people because I do this sometimes where I do some wrangling and then I pump it into my ggplot. My argument is, is that these extra geom calls should be indented. I don't know. I wanted to open it up to the group to see what they think because I've seen this code and it works, but I think these extra layers should be indented, but I wanted to see what people think about that. Or it doesn't matter. <laughs> and I'm just thinking about it too, um, too deeply, but. I can totally see your argument for it. I don't do it. I did it for some time. And then I looked it up, I think, in the Tideverse style guide, and I didn't seem to do it. And then I stopped doing it. But because the visualization, it's its own thing, right? It's almost like arguments for just the visualization. So I feel like indenting that makes, to me, also sense. So I totally get why you are doing it. Yeah, it's just one of those weird things that this is like the one rule that I keep going back and forth on is do I indent this, do I not? And it doesn't matter. This is valid code. Like this code will run. Like I will get a visualization at the end of it. So like many, some people are probably sitting there like, Colin, why do you care? You, your code's running. It's just going back to that, like that craft of it. <laughs> do you actually indent this? In my mind, you do. I guess the other way to think about this too is, is that you, you could because technically you're doing two things, you're doing some group by summarizing here and then doing visualization, you could take this code, create a variable and then write ggplot code. That would probably make this a little bit more easier to read. Takes a little bit more in regards to creating more syntax or more kind of typing and stuff. But yeah, I guess for the people that are new here, probably like, wow, style is a really big thing. And people are thinking about these things. It's like, yeah. Um, you kind of get into it. You're just like, what do I do? Um, yeah, Milo says the thing. I'm glad you're with me, Milo. Pro indent. Maybe we can start a movement here and we can start something on social media and be like, we're pro indent if you do some wrangling code into ggplot2. I don't know. So, but let's see. So, um, some more stuff about ggplot2 spacing. So, ggplot. Uh, has a lot of arguments sometimes within the specific functions that it has, especially within Geom. Um, same thing, right? Instead of writing out a lot of these, each one of them should get their own line. Yes, it makes it longer. Yes, it's going to expand the number of lines that your ggplot code 2 has, but it allows you to more easily extend this to make changes if you need to in the future. Let's see. And then... The last thing, and we've already talked about code comments, but this was add an additional conversation that was added to it, is the idea of doing section comments. So um, there is a kind of a, uh, a a key binding that you can use in our studio, whether it be Command Shift R or Control Shift R, that will actually put this into your files that you have. It's just like sections; it helps you break things up. They're kind of like headers, right? Like if you're familiar with like web design or document design, like these are like headings, right? And you can put these headings in here to help you kind of break up code. Um, I do this quite a bit in like shiny code. Like if I'm developing a shiny app, like 
if I know that this is a certain section for the Shiny app, I'll slap in a section comment to be like, all this code under here is associated with this one component. And it helps me kind of break things up a little bit more when I'm reading through it to know like this specific section is just associated with this code. Okay. So that's it. That's chapter four workflow code style. Um, I think I'll open it up for the group to ask any questions or comments or further discussion. And I'll take a look at the chat while anybody jumps in. I just wanted to say, uh, really one of the hardest thing is when someone doesn't do any line breaks in their code. So take that part seriously if you're just starting to code. I have some colleagues who like to go way beyond 80 or I would say 160 characters. And it's just so much harder to parse what's happening. And also I can't even see the code you know, at a glance, even in my editor, if it's full screen, uh, except I make the pane you know, full, full width of my screen. So if I have any recommendation other than good naming, it's like make clever line breaks so your code is much more readable. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't know if that's the picture that you shared. There is a way to put in a um, this like little line. I don't know if people can see it because it's kind of small. In our studio, you can set it up. There's a setting in here where you can set it to have a line like a line that shows you where 80 characters are. Um, so if you're somebody that follows that convention or team that follows it, there is a setting in here, so I'm trying to dig for it here. But I don't know, Stefan, I can't see the picture you shared. So did, I don't know if you shared this or not. Oh, I sent a, a shared a sh setting that uh, actually colors your indentation level. So, you know, the first level of indentation is like red and the second level of indentation is another color. So you much more easier also see how far you indented because I find it sometimes hard if you have a longer block to see if my closing parentheses are at the right indentation level, if that makes sense. And so that just helps with that setting. Yeah, I know there's a plate. I know there uh show margin. I think it's this one here. Yeah. Okay. So there's the setting in the global options under display. There's a show margin option. If you click on this, you can set the margin whatever you want. So like eight, so for the people that are not familiar, so like as you type, you know, horizontally is like I think it I think it starts at one or does it start at zero? I can't remember. Um well I can check. Um, I'll check that here in a second, but basically you can change this to set it whatever you want your margin column to be. So you can click this and it should add this little line on your sign to show you where 80 characters are. Um, and then, so if you're writing code and you hit this line, it will let you go beyond it. But if you hit that, it's a good sign to be like, oh, maybe I'm going too horizontal for it. This is an old, old convention. Um, like people are asked the question of where does this 80 character margin line come from? I think it comes from like old computing where they used to use the actual like punch cards to do computing. Those were only 80 characters in length. And so the convention kind of fell through all software development of like some people saying, you still need to follow the 80 character convention. So fuck. some things come back to old computer science concepts. So but I am not a computer programmer. I'm not a computer scientist. Somebody please correct me if I'm not. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. That's a good point. I forgot to mention that. Um, trying to think of what else. Um, the other thing that I did want to show, if people are interested in like, um, like why this kind of like these, like doing, so like having this and like splitting this up, I don't know if anybody's familiar with like modal programming. So like if anybody uses like Emacs or Vim or have experience with that, this is great because you can actually set up to have Vim key bindings in our studio. But what's nice about having this kind of ordered this way in this style is you can quickly delete a line and then drop a line down. So this is really nice for you able to quickly move things very, very quickly in your code if you follow the style guide. <laughs> If you're not interested in modal programming, don't worry about it. But I'm really interested in it. If you have some questions about it, I would love to talk more about it because I think it's a really interesting way to write code. But if you're just starting out, don't worry about what I just said. So cool. What else do people have? Anything else that people want to look at, discuss, 
a bit of a shorter chapter, um, but I'll open it up for any other conversation or discussion people might have. All right, cool. Well, let me stop share. Um, again, I really appreciate everybody jumping in today. I'm going to do the stop because that's another ad thing I need to do. I'll hang